Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television SBTV. I'm Stephen T, and we're here with another Electric Vehicles Metals Market Update dated early July 2021, where we're continuing our review of some of the biggest stories that dominated in the first half of this year. Uh, on today's show, we'll be continuing with our look at nickel, of course, and focusing on the Chinese nickel giant Tingshan and their impact on the market, as well as the implications of some of their announcements for nickel investors. Now, before we do, if you're in fact new to this channel or if you have to subscribe, please subscribe to our channel, hit the bell button for notifications and updates from us, and feel free to give us a thumbs up or a like if you do enjoy what we do, because we truly do appreciate your support and thank you greatly for it. We begin with this March 2021 report here from Roskill titled Nickel, Tingshan to disrupt the nickel market again. Now, the article begins Tingshan, the world's largest nickel producer, announced last week it will supply nickel mat based on converted nickel pig iron, or NPI, from its operations at Indonesia's Morowali Industrial Park, IMIP. Supplies will go to Chinese companies Huayo and CNGR Advanced Materials, which will be further processed to produce battery-grade nickel sulfate. Tingshan will supply 60 kilotons of nickel mat growth to Huayo and 40 kilotons of mat growth to CNGR within a one-year period, starting from October 2021. Tingshan now also claims that it has the capability to supply high-grade nickel mat on a regular basis. Switching very quickly here to S&P Global Market Intelligence's March report for nickel by Jason Sapor says that the LME three-month nickel price dropped from a seven-year high of US$20,000 per tonne in trading in late February to $16,000 per tonne on March 30th, the lowest since November 2020, upon Tingshan's announcement. It says here that this quarter, London Metal Exchange nickel prices are set to record their worst performance since the same period a year ago after a potential game-changing battery nickel supply announcement from China's Tingshan Group depressed bullish investor sentiment. This year is important here. Tingshan will supply a combined total of 100,000 tons of nickel mat beginning in October. Now, some investors may be wondering what nickel mat actually even is. As you all know, silver bullion only offers class one nickel, the finest grade of nickel, so to speak, the kind most desired for use in EV batteries by automakers and EV giants and mine fresh from sulfide ore. So why would our investors need to know about class two nickel, let alone intermediates between class one and class two like nickel man, and that's exactly what it is. But if it's all a tad confusing at the moment right now, let's get back to some definitions. If you find yourself sweating like Robert Hayes in the comedy classic Airplane, Australian business resource publication Stockhead had this headline, Should Nickel Balls Be Worried About Dirty Things on Battery Metals? by Ruben Adams. The article says, first, some definitions. Nickel is usually found in two main ore types, sulfide or laterite. Laterites, class 2, are good for NPI, nickel pig iron, which is used as a cheaper alternative to pure nickel for the production of stainless steel. Sulfites, class 1, the kind we sell at silver bullion, are turned into battery-grade nickel sulfate much more cheaply and easier than nickel laterites, and they fetch a higher price. Now, most investors understand the two classes of nickel, yet some investors invariably ask, but why then does Singchan even matter? Isn't it just dealing with class 2 stainless steel nickel? And on one hand, that's true. Yet, Tingshan matters because, one, as the world's largest nickel consumer as well as nickel stainless steel producer, their mere statement and announcement that they are developing technology to turn class 2 laterite ore into nickel pig iron, and then taking that nickel pig iron to move it into the intermediate stuff known as nickel mat, and then taking that nickel mat, crossing from class 2 into class 1 to turn it into nickel sulfate, which then can go on into EV batteries, that tree-level jump, excuse me, which Tingshan is claiming it's able to do, that has consequences, because if they can do what they claim, could they possibly suddenly change the nickel supply chain bottleneck that we saw in the previous episode? The second issue is that Tingshan matters because just a mere claim or announcement that they are already going to create or suddenly create class 1 battery-grade nickel from class 2 nickel that has already had an effect on global nickel prices. Very quickly, this SMP Global Market Intelligence chart shows you the LME nickel prices dropped upon Tingshan's announcement in March. We can see the blue line, the lightest blue line, indicates nickel prices rising and coming down again in 2019 before going right through the COVID-19 pandemic throughout 2020, which is the dark blue line or the black line. And this continued all the way upwards on the trajectory up until the high point in February, which is now indicating the yellow line, which refers to 2021. Now, the prices were already coming down, but Tingshan's announcement obviously plummeted it down a little bit further. 
Now, of course, since then, the nickel price has been steadily rising again, back to 18,000 US dollars per ton recently, which shows you and I that possibly that the nickel market is much more robust than we otherwise might have perceived. However, because China had once used old furnace processes to create a massive increase in the output of low-grade nickel that became known as nickel pig iron or NPI, as we talked about earlier. And this was done back in 2007. And this back then put a strain on pure nickel demand that then affected the price back then. So now once again, fast forward a decade later, Tingshan step up again, and this time they're using the ore from Indonesia once again. So investors have naturally expressed caution. While others, meanwhile, have said, well, perhaps this time this is a good thing. After all, aren't experts all talking about a potential class 1 nickel sulfide supply shortage? Returning to Stockhead's article, it says that supply of nickel sulfides is declining because of lack of new discoveries. At the same time, demand is climbing, hence the bullish sentiment which had driven prices to near 10-year highs. News that Tingshan was about to supply a big chunk of this battery nickel shortfall with converted class 2 nickel, largely avoided until now due to higher conversion costs, loss of cobalt as a byproduct, and an elevated carbon footprint, was enough to put a dent in this sentiment. Now we'll get back to the carbon footprint point really shortly. But as a quick aside on the point about a lack of new discoveries, SBTV was speaking to Nickel28 CEO Anthony Mylewski last month, as some of our audiences may recall, and he told us that the lack of price incentives remains the real concern, because for him, producers will commonly not risk building too many new mines to meet the Class 1 global nickel shortage until nickel's price rises to a point that incentivizes them to do so with promise of solid returns. And this is where we hit somewhat of a so-called ostensible paradox of some sort um, and probably explain why some are divided about Ting Shan. You see, the world acknowledges that there is a class one nickel shortage. Um, you need nickel prices, prices to arise so that more mines will be built to extract that class one nickel. Ting Shan have stepped in and said, hey, we can take class two nickel, bypass the processes and get to class one and we'll save time. Ironically, it is Ting Shan's announcement that has meant nickel's prices have gone downwards because investors are taking a cautious wait and see approach to see if Ting Shan, Ting Shan can actually deliver. Now, Alex Hamer of the Investors Chronicle UK calls this the crossroads. He wrote a headline here for the article titled Tesla or Ting Shan Nickel Market at Crossroads and goes on to say that the Ting Shan deal essentially effectively sees the company promise to fill class one demand with class two supply possibly removing the price gap and supply concerns. Nickel mat, which Jingshan is selling, is the last step in a lot of processing. Now, this isn't just sending the ore around a plant a few more times. This process will add cost and carbon footprint compared to class one nickel supply. Goes on to say that Jingshan has previously managed to generate some level of notoriety outside the metals world, thanks to a plan to dump millions of tons of mine waste into the sea in Indonesia. While this has since been rethought, the processing needed to turn the ore from these mines, high pressure acid leaching or HPAL, is still extremely expensive and hard to get right, on top of needing huge amounts of power, often from coal plants. Now, HPAL or high pressure acid leaching acid is known as a huge topic which we will have to cover in another episode separately. But for our purposes, HPAL is the main method that has been developed in the nickel industry with the hope that the industry can convert low grade laterite ore or class 2 nickel into premium grade class 1 battery grade nickel material through chemical processing that is, um, a, you know, arguably safer. HPAL, however, has proved an expensive process over the years with cost overruns in several projects and mines. And Ting Shan stepped in to say, hey, we can bypass HPAL as well with our process. Alex Hamer, however, is saying that Ting Shan's very announcement forces the nickel market to make a choice at the crossroads. Should EV ma battery makers go with Ting Shan or stick to existing methods like continuing to push for new class one mines, as we've been talking about, whilst at the same time waiting for HPAL to become more effective? It would also seem then that HPAL's risks and costs were already factored into why the nickel prices were continuing to go up and soar in recent years. Um, this, of course, until Singshan came in with the announcement that they're offering a short term supply solution while the kinks of HPAL are, no pun intended, ironed out. Hamer, however, is saying that because of these ESG and quality risks, companies like Tesla remain at these crossroads when it comes to the longer term. But here's the thing, have giants like Tesla actually already made their choice at the crossroads?
Now, in our last episode, we saw that Tesla went to New Caledonia to sit as advisors on the Goro nickel mine that was sold by South American mining giant Vale to a Swiss consortium consisting of Trifigura. And we can see here that Trifigura is named in this article as batting on a green nickel squeeze in defiance of a Chinese cure. This article by Yvonne Yueli and Andy Hoffman. I'm just going to zoom in here for a bit. And we can see an important quote from Juan Socrates Economu, head of nickel and cobalt trading at Trifigura. His quote says... The Goro deal shows Trafigura and Tesla don't see Tinkan's new processing method as a panacea for meeting surging demand for nickel used in the batteries needed to help wean the world off of fossil fuels. Car makers' preference for cleaner sources of aluminum and cobalt suggest they'll follow a similar line on nickel. Now, could this article be right in saying that Trafigura were willing to buy over the Goro mine asset even though it was losing money, precisely because they were betting that Tesla would still come to them? And what does mean Tesla, if they are emblematic of the other EV giants? Would it prove that they've already made their decision? Have the EV market giants already indicated that they may not want to risk using Ting Shan's supplies? Furthermore, Roskill's report actually says that what Ting Shan claims it is able to do is really all, not all that new at all. Now, the Roskill view is that Ting Shan's plans to convert NPI or a lower grade nickel nickel that we've seen earlier on to an intermediate nickel mat. It's not an entirely new processing concept for nickel. The French mining giant Aramat previously converted a portion of its nickel output to produce nickel mat at its Don Iambo operation in New Caledonia. What's interesting for us is that Aramat subsequently ended this process, as you can see here, instead opting to export nickel to stainless steel mills in Asia. Further on in this article, we can see that despite Tingshan demonstrating the NPI to MAT conversion process to be economically viable, concerns remain over the sustainability of this source of nickel production. Smelting of laterite ores to produce NPI is highly energy intensive, and with these operations' reliance on coal burning as an energy source, this nickel is associated with some of the highest CO2 emissions in the industry. This could provide Western original equipment manufacturers or OEMs, the likes of Tesla, with a difficult decision in terms of nickel procurement from these sources. After all, these companies have placed ESG high up on their list of raw material procurement criteria. So the Roskill team makes some excellent points. There is also the matter of Tingshan being the world's largest nickel consumer at the same time as being one of the world's largest producers of nickel, stainless steel, of course. But is there a potential conflict in that Tingshan needs nickel prices to be low for it to continue to buy nickel cheaply so that it can keep producing nickel? And is there also a need for us to discern as investors and draw certain conclusions from certain announcements that have been put out without it casting any aspersions, of course? As you can see, these are all matters investors have to factor in and tether and manage. Yet, are we also in danger, in danger of being too harsh on Ting Shan? Ken Hoffman of McKinsey reminds us that perhaps we shouldn't jump too quickly to condemn Ting Shan or reach oversimplified conclusions either. Now, back at a global mining symposium in May, Ken Hoffman told editor Frick Els of the Northern Miner that the process Ting Shan plans to use is new and dates to the mid-1970s. It didn't work fantastically well. It's not cheap either. The purity of the product is another issue too. Contracts for nickel products are often required to specify impurities down to the parts per billion, he's noted. In particular, the presence of iron in the product can detrimentally affect the EV battery's performance. However, Hoffman said he hopes that Ting Shan's plans work. As every US $1,000 increase in the nickel price adds about 80 US cents per kilo hour to the cost of an EV. If prices increase by 10,000 US dollars to 15,000 US dollars per ton, you're looking at about a 20 to 30% increase in the cost of the battery, he explained. Now, this would dovetail, it seems, with this article titled The Many Forces Driving Nickel Price Volatility, was written by Gregory D.L. Morris. The Fast Markets team, including those that put this on Metal Market magazine, published this article. And Gregory D.L. Morris was speaking to the head of battery research at Fast Markets, and he had this to say. His name is Will Adams. He said... In most cases, nickel is likely to be a very sought-after metal. But some battery raw material companies are looking at making nickel sulfate from the ores that go to make class 2 nickel materials, such as nickel pig iron, as we have seen on today's show. This is the critical bit. Only if they're economically viable and environmentally acceptable, then would we'll just take some pressure off of nickel producers.
Now, Fast Markets also has a graphic here which shows that by 2025, the amount of nickel used by EVs is estimated to be 8.5 times more than in 2018. This means you need 600,000 tons of nickel compared to 70,000 tons in 2018. And for Hoffman and Adams, as we've seen in the preceding articles, perhaps there's enough of the demand buy to go around and you can afford to have Ting Shan coming up with a way to increase nickel supply to some degree and extent, provided they get the quality right, which has proved difficult over the years. Now, Ting Shan claim it will have deliverables by October of this year, and if they fail, the nickel price would and might possibly conversely resume its stunning rise. The thing is, even if Ting Shan do pull it off, will Tesla and the EV manufacturers risk buying Ting Shan's product, considering quality and ESG issues are at play and at stake? In contrast, class 1 nickel for EV batteries mined from nickel sulfide ore remains unchanged. These are hard assets, the kind we offer at Silver Bullion. Now on this show we merely offer financial opinion and not financial advice obviously, so you will have to make your own call on all this. But it would seem that investors who truly understand the nickel market would remain focused on the bigger picture and the EV long game and not fear the sing chance of this world at all. Now, that's all our time we have for this week and this edition of SBTV's EV Metals Market Update. Until next month, saddle up, silver up, and take care. Excited about the opportunities in the coming electric vehicle revolution and looking to invest in this electrification super cycle? Demand for battery metals like nickel and cobalt is expected to rise in tandem with the increase in demand for lithium-ion batteries in electric vehicles. You can now buy nickel and cobalt parcels with silver bullion and have a direct price exposure to both battery metals. You have the option to buy 2-ton nickel parcels or 250-kilogram cobalt drums. Every parcel will be fully insured against loss and guaranteed to be genuine by silver bullion. Selling your parcels to lock in profits is as simple as logging into your silver bullion account, selecting the parcels and clicking sell. Buy your nickel and cobalt parcels now at Silver Bullion's website, www.silverbullion.com.sg slash EV, and participate in the electric vehicle revolution. Interested but have questions? Email us at sales at silverbullion.com.sg or give us a call at plus 65 6100 3040.